started a series a few weeks ago called Simply Important, and it's the, really it's the foundational pieces to being um, a faithful uh, follower of Jesus. It also happens to be the basis for the covenant of membership in a Methodist church, and there are five kind of elements of that, <clears throat> your prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. And today we're looking at the final uh, of those five, and that is witness. And so I want, I want to lead you in an exercise here this morning and uh, ask you to participate in this. And here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like for you to imagine your life with me for just a few moments and for those of you that have been that have a relationship with Christ and you've been walking with Christ I want you to imagine in this exercise that you don't know Christ now if you're here this morning and you're here out of curiosity and you uh, haven't or you don't have a relationship uh, with Christ um, I want to tell you that we're glad you're here, and you're the reason uh, why we exist, and I'll, that'll, that'll be clear as we go through this this morning. Um, we who are in this exercise, who have had a relationship with Christ, believe that there is a goodness and grace at the heart of the universe, and that is God, and we believe that we have to experience this goodness and grace, and we have to know what God, through this goodness and grace, has done for us. So we're glad you're here if you're curious. So I want you to imagine for just a moment, you that are followers of Christ, that you don't have a relationship with Jesus. You find yourself going through life and you're asking some questions. Why? And maybe some of you can remember asking yourself these questions. Why am I here? What is my purpose in life? There's no voice from heaven that ever answers. And you lose a loved one, um, like some of you have done, and not so long ago. Uh, you lose a loved one, you lose somebody you love, a child has problems, one of your kids ODs, your wife is diagnosed with cancer when she's 40, your husband dies of a heart attack when he's 50, and that's the end of the story. There's no hope that you'll ever see them again. Where do you go with that? And we're imagining we don't have a relationship with God. Where do you go with that? Where do you find healing for those difficult moments, those tragedies, those places in your life that come to every one of us? Where do you go? Or you make a bad mistake. And you feel bad about the mistakes that you've made. And uh, you feel that the guilt... And, and the shame is sort of covering you. And where do you turn to get rid of that? Where do you turn to experience forgiveness or, or just the opportunity to start over again? You're overcome by an addiction. And you're eaten up. Or you're eaten up with bitterness on the inside. And someone says to you something like this, well, just seek a higher power. But you don't believe in such a thing. You don't believe that a higher power exists. You have everything the world tells you you need to be happy, and yet on the inside of you, there, you know there's something missing, that you have all of the things that were supposed to bring what you thought that they would bring, and still there's something that you yearn for on the inside that none of those things seem to fulfill. And the feelings never go away. And when 
you're not so busy when your agenda slows down a little bit and, and things are not so crazy. You sense it again. There's something missing. But you don't believe that there's anything other than what you've experienced. Imagine that that's your life. Imagine that this is your today and your tomorrow and your forever. How does that, how does that feel on the inside? I mean, we're going through this exercise, right? You're imagining this with me. How does that make you feel on the inside? What, what does that do to you? You know people whose lives are like that. And you know people that live the way I've just described. People who have not yet connected with that goodness and grace that's at the center of the universe, that is the heart of God. You know people like that. People who have not yet experienced a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. A personal relationship that washes away, washes away all of that guilt and shame and past mistakes that cleanses and that communicates and tells them that they can start over again. Today's a new day. They can start over and answer the deepest questions of their soul. I think you probably know a few people like that. The Bible describes people like that. And what the Bible says these people are, these people are lost they are lost from what's most real in life they are lost from their true selves they are lost from God and why did Jesus come into the world in the first place why did he come knowing that he was going to be rejected why, why would he even come why did he come knowing that he was going to be beaten and, and scourged and spat upon? Why did he come knowing that was going to happen to him? And ultimately, he would die an excruciating death on the cross through crucifixion. And when he breathed his last breath, he would hear in that last moment, cynical self-righteous men laughing at his pain and calling him a fool for dying that way why did the father allow the one he loves to experience that here's the reason I'll say this again in a minute but this is point number one. Because lost people matter to God. Lost people matter. People who are alone. People who have wandered off their, their path. People who have rejected God's love. Pe rejected God's love. People who have broken his heart. They matter deeply to God. Jesus came so that the lost can be found, so that God could get his kids back. That's why Jesus came. This chapter that uh, Shonda read from in Luke's gospel, chapter 15, is called the lost chapter. And the reason it's called that is because there's three, there's three narratives in that chapter. The lost sheep, the lost coin, and then the last story is the story of the lost brothers the two brothers and we didn't read that because it's longer and I just want to kind of describe that last story of the two brothers uh, there's a son a younger son that rejects his father and his father's love and he goes to a far country this is the most famous of the three and he goes to a far country a distant land and he kind of gives himself to all kinds of things that he knows are wrong and shameful and finally, 
in this distant land, he gets down, you know, pretty basic in life. And, and, and the scripture tells us that he came to his senses. He realized what he had done, the mistake that he made, and he realizes he needs to go back home to his dad. And in his mind, he's crafted this confession of all the things he's going to tell his dad he's sorry for, of what he's rejected and what he's done. And so he's, he's created this confession in his mind. Then he heads home, and he's walking up the driveway to the house. He's going over the confession, but before, before he gets to the house and before he, he gets to his dad, his dad sees him. You know the story. And the dad rushes out and throws his arms around his boy, and he kisses his face, and he calls him my son. Now, the older brother who has been home doing everything, sort of, is not excited about his younger brother coming home, and he's not excited about the treatment that his dad's given this younger brother. The father's throwing a party on his behalf, the younger brother's behalf. Here's what the father explains as what, what he's doing, of what's going on. He said, we had to celebrate. We had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and now is alive again. He was lost and now is found. People really get lost in life. Did you know that? People really get lost. Some people get lost because of the terrible things that they do. They may get lost because of the shame and the guilt that they experience because of the terrible things they do. Some people get lost because of the terrible things that are done to them. They get lost in pain and bitterness and woundedness in their lives. Some people get lost because they're told terrible things about God. That God is harsh and unforgiving and uncaring. Some people get lost because they're told terrible things about themselves, mostly when they're young. Things about how they're unwanted and unworthy and unlovable and unredeemable. We were in Ada this week for Thanksgiving to our daughters, and they have some friends, and a friend is a physician in town. And, and part of his story is his mom and dad got a divorce when he was, he was like eight, seven or eight. And uh, he had an older sister that was 18 and living on her own. And one day his mom took him over to his sister's and said, I'm going to go get a Coke and I'll be back. And he didn't see her for three years. Kind of raised himself in some ways. Sometimes we're told when we're young we're unwanted and unlovable. And sometimes it's not the words. It's the way we're treated. And every story is important. And no matter how we get lost, no matter how that happens, and I'm not going to be able to articulate all of the stories of the way that lostness comes to us. But the way we get lost, it doesn't matter that so much. Because there's one large overarching truth, and that's this. The Father is waiting for you to come home. The Father wants you to be found, and that's why Jesus came. That's why he sent his only son, so that he could throw his arms around you and around me and kiss us on the face and call us his children. I know some of you, and I know some of your stories, and some of you have prodigal sons and daughters. And you have children who are wasting their lives. I said this in the first service, and a mother came up and talked to me and says, what do you do? And I said, you don't give up. You keep loving. 
Some of your kids are wasting their lives and their potential. Some of you had children, some are giving themselves to things that are degrading and destructive. Some of you had, have children who are, em, who are emotionally par paralyzed. They just can't move forward in life. They can't get going, and I've seen what that does to you. I know how it weighs on you. And I know in the back of your mind, you're thinking of them through the day. And I know that you worry about your kids, and it's because you love your child and your children more than life. And I know how you pray something like this. Dear God, please send someone to my child God, please send someone to my child who will love my child, who will be kind to them, who will lead my child back to you. Please, Lord, send someone who is willing to help my child come to their senses and find peace and come home. That is exactly the way our Heavenly Father feels about his children that are lost, exactly like you feel. And it might be that someone who is supposed to bring one of those lost children back to the father, now listen, it might be that the one that's supposed to bring one of those lost children back to the father is you, is one of you. One of the things that happened uh, this week at Thanksgiving is uh, our son-in-law, Dan, his brother lives in Pennsylvania and uh, they came home for Thanksgiving, and they have a new baby. And uh, they go to a Methodist church in Pennsylvania, but they came to Ada. They wanted the baby baptized in Ada. And so I was talking to Sarah about it, and, you know, why Ada? And Sarah said, there's a retired minister there, Roberto Escamilla, and uh, he is kind of the pastor emeritus, uh, works at the church uh, with the pastor that's appointed there. And Ben wanted him to baptize his new baby girl. And I said, you know, and so Sarah started, me, started telling me the story that when Ben went away to college, and you know how our kids, when they go away for a congregation like us, when the kids graduate from high school and you guys go off to college, we kind of forget about them, don't we? You don't forget about your own kids, but uh, let me just pick one, somebody from the congregation, and I, if I were to ask you, who graduated last year that's in college as a freshman now? Could any of you name one? Ben wanted Roberto to baptize his child because Roberto stayed in connection with Ben all the way through college. Wow. It might be that someone who is supposed to bring one of those lost children back to the Father is you. I've been talking about being lost. And you may identify that you feel that you're one of those lost ones. And again, if that's your situation, I want to tell you it does not matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how far you've wandered off the path. It doesn't matter what you've given yourself to in life because the Father Father in heaven wants you to come home. Maybe as I've talked, you've thought about someone you know, maybe a friend of yours or a work colleague or a neighbor or a coworker, or one of your kids or a wife or a husband or a family member, a brother or sister that you know needs to know that grace and goodness at the center of the universe that I talked about at the beginning of this sermon. They need to discover Maybe what you've discovered. 
what we're talking about today is being a witness. Frank talked about that during the offering. And I know when I say that, when I say we're supposed to be a, a witness, that that makes you nervous. It makes you anxious. Just to bring up the topic creates some anxiety. And I get that. But listen. If you really believe there's a heaven and a hell, and if you believe it's possible that there is a heaven and a hell, and if you believe in the real goodness and grace and mercy of God, and you don't tell people who are lost, now listen, and you don't tell people who are lost, can you really say that those people matter to you? Can we say they matter to us like they matter to God? So here was point one again. Lost people matter. And point two is this. The second thing that I want to tell you is people who are lost that matter to us, what that really means is that our call is to be their friend. Now listen, secular people don't want to, they just don't, they just don't wake up one morning and say, you know, and secular, what I mean by secular is ir irreligious people, people who don't have a relationship or claim any connection with God, secular people, they just don't wake up one morning and say, you know, I'd like to change my entire worldview. I would like to change my mind on the most important things that I've ever believed. It doesn't work that way, does it? It doesn't happen that way. I can guarantee you that none of you came here today and you woke up one morning and said something like this, I'm going to go to church today. And I'm going to ask a Savior I don't believe in to forgive me of my sins that I don't feel guilty about so that I can go to heaven that I don't think exists. That's kind of absurd, isn't it? I mean, that just doesn't automatically happen. Anybody who comes in here for the first time, you think they think that? I mean, there's a couple reasons why people come to church. It's an emotional issue or relational issue. And what I mean by that is this, is they're not at peace with themselves. And I talk to people occasionally who are struggling. There's something they know is not right on the inside. They're not at peace with themselves. Or the other issue is they're not at peace with somebody that's important to them in their life, a relationship. They want to find some help. And not everybody who has those problems come to church because they feel like Christians are, tend to be judgmental or are unreal. And they're either going to condemn them for what they think or believe or going to ignore them. What gets people coming to church where they can contemplate some spiritual issue or reality for the first time is because they have a relationship with somebody that knows them and likes them and invites them to come. And the key to that phrase is knows and likes them. For someone to spend time with you, I mean, they don't, you know, people don't have to do that. But for someone to spend time, it takes time, doesn't it? You have to spend enough time where you get to know them and like them. Bill Hybel says one of the, he founded one of the most effective churches, mega churches in the U.S. who reach secular people. He says to reach secular people, you have to, one, understand what they believe, and two, like them. Look at Matthew 11, where... Jesus is accused of being friends with sinners. The key is to understand what they believe and to like them. When I'm asking you about being a witness for Christ, I'm really not asking you to go tell somebody about Jesus. There will be a time for that. I'm not saying that's in, not important, but there's a time for that. What I'm saying is you need to be a friend. 
There's a website called Men of Integrity, and they, they allow people to put stories up on their website. And there was a man that put a story, his story, up there. He said he never grew up in church, never went to church. As an adult, he had no interest in spiritual things. He discovered his neighbor next door was a Christian, but his relationship with his neighbor only went as far as saying hi, sharing a few tools, and maybe they helped each other move some furniture around. His wife was diagnosed with cancer, and after the diagnosis, she lived for three months before she died. He said she was his world. He was so devastated that he said that it was like when she died that he was going through a trance. It was surreal. It was like, you know, he, he just going through all of the preparation and the service. And, and he said it was, all, it was just unreal until he went home to an empty house. And then he realized how alone he was and how much his wife really meant to him and that he would never see her again. He couldn't stay in the house. As evening came, he stepped outside in the backyard and at the back of their backyard was a river and there was a path along the river. And he walked down to the river into that path and he started walking. He said what he didn't know... Uh, at that time was his neighbor had been looking out and saw him go walk across the backyard and go down to the river and so his neighbor walked down there this man walked all night long and three or four steps behind him was his neighbor who never said a word all night long When the sun came up, as it was coming up the next morning, the neighbor said, hey, let's go get some breakfast and talk. The man ended his story by saying, I go to church now, my neighbor's church. A religion that can produce that kind of caring and concern, I want to find, more, find out more about. I want to love and be loved like that for the rest of my life. Wow. Everybody carries something, don't they? And the final point is this. Being a witness means living what we say we believe. In this postmodern world we live in, in postmodern culture, Part of what it means is that every belief is considered equal to everything else. None is considered more true than another. It doesn't matter if you believe about what you believe about Jesus, about how rationally compelling your story is or your argument. It's still just your story, your truth. What people want to see in this seeing is believing era is not that your beliefs are rational but they are powerful enough to transform your life to make a difference in you and for you to live differently than the culture you live in so let me just read this passage of scripture from first peter 2 peter's reading uh, writing to non uh, uh, christians living in a non-christian culture and he says, dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among pagans that if they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits. In other words, what he's saying is, you know, you belong to a different kingdom now. You have different values than the values you had when you were growing up. And people are going to be looking at your life to see if you're living what you believe you say you believe. Are you? Do you? Will you? 
There's communion at each corner, places to pray. I invite you to respond as the Holy Spirit leads you. If you bring your commitment, there's baskets here. Let's stand and respond as the Holy Spirit leads us today.